Good morning. I think it's time to start. And with the first presentation, you've met Sam and Rory yesterday already. So I will just add that they are main contributors, co-authors of Enzyme and Sam. Yep. Enzyme or Enzyme, enzyme. people, people say both. <laughs> <laughs> people can agree. It's just like Linux. Okay, so welcome, welcome today. Good, good morning, and we can start with the first presentation. Sam, Rory. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, to everybody. I'll uh, start by introducing Rory. Um, so you, you met Rory yesterday, but we'll, we'll go into a little bit more detail th th today. Um, so Rory was writing mobile games before, before it was cool. Um, and he was doing dynamic networks before clusters were cool. And uh, at the weekends, he, he likes to show people around an old windmill, which is interesting. Um, and he, you seen yesterday that he, he recently started Scalinator. Um, another thing you might not know, though, is that he is a martial artist who is a a trained swordsman, which uh, does pose problems whenever we're waiting for the Scala compiler. <laughs> it does give us something of an incentive to keep our code nice and clean. So I'll pass over to Rory now. So that's me. Um, as Sam says, you know, he gets a bit scared when he does shapeless magic that takes 30 seconds to compile. It's quite funny. Now, Sam has some interesting things. So I've got to try and get this right because I always have to try and remember the acronym every time I see it. Free high school science textbooks. So whilst in South Africa, Sam actually was involved and wrote textbooks. And now those are open source textbooks given out uh, in South Africa to students every year, uh, which I always think is an amazing uh, thing. Libra. Libra, oh, oh, free. <laughs> it says, look, look, free high schools. <laughs> he co-founded a mathematics company and uh, quantum mechanics, machine learning. And one of the things that I always find interesting is the fact that when we always say, you know, it's not rocket science, one of the things they did was actually rocket science. So people actually do do that, apparently. Um, did some weird things like brain scanners and fiction. Um, if you use Apache Spark, you probably use NetLibJov without knowing about it, and uh, Sam was... Blame Sam. And uh, anybody here play Kerbal? Nobody. One. One. Two people have admitted it. Yeah, there's, there's a few. So uh, apparently Sam did actually get to the moon. Um, a year later, he's yet to provide any proof that he got back again. <laughs> so a quick straw poll. Uh, editors, who uses IntelliJ? I think we had this yesterday. Everybody. Right, OK. Eclipse. Some. Excellent. Some people are involved in writing it, so they have to. I don't <laughs> <laughs> Enzyme, Enzyme, whatever you fancy. Way. Um, Emacs. Hey. Vim. Oh, you can't use both. That's cheating. <laughs> yeah, you can. You can. Yeah. You know, you 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 you, you, you like the <laughs> evil mode. You like the pain. <laughs> Atom. Uh, Sublime. Hey. Uh, and no IDE weirdos. Come on, put your hand up. We saw you. You told us about this yesterday. <laughs> so. A, a quick TLDR, Enzyme is not really an IDE, it's a tool set for building IDEs and building other tools on top of it. Um, I'm really interested in analyzing code. A uh, quick overview of the talk, um, Sam's going to do a demo and talk about the architecture and our ecosystem and our community, which I think is one of the most interesting things for us. And then I'm going to talk about the future. So, hand over to Sam. Thanks, Rory. Um, I'm probably going to start using the, the space bar here for this, because we've got a wee video. Right. <coughs> full screen. Is that gone full screen? That's not gone full screen. Yep. OK. 
Okay, that's working. Right, so this is just going to be a very, very quick demo of an Emacs session using Enzyme. But this, uh, the features that we're about to show here work for all of the editors in Enzyme, including Atom, um, Sublime, and, uh, and Vim. Oh, Vim's a wee bit behind. Right, so first thing we're doing here is just starting up the server. And you can see an SPT session there. We're using SPT to, to deploy um, the, the server binaries incrementally. Um, that can be quite slow. Right, OK, so this is just Emacs in normal Scala editing mode. There's no enzyme here. And um, the first thing you can notice is we've got some kind of uh, highlighting, text highlighting, but it's not perfect. This is based on regular expressions. Um, so we're going to turn on enzyme. And there's the enzyme server starting up. And now we're going to get semantic information. So what really happened here is that now we've got all the correct colorings of everything. And that's the enzyme server telling us. So you can have a look, for example, inside the interpolated strings, it, uh, we can tell that this is a, a value. So it, it, it does um, semantic highlighting within interpolated strings as well as everywhere else. And it gets information that you can't just get from regular expressions, such as telling the difference between when something's a method call, when something's a var, and when something's a val. Um, the kind of stuff where you really need the, the compiler to give you that information. OK, now let's do something with this, uh, with this code. So we're just writing a, a foo variable. Um, underlines the variables, uh, gives them special highlighting. And we're creating a string. Uh, then, we'll, then we're creating a file. Now, we get an, a red squiggly under the file because we haven't imported Java IO file yet. What can we do, with that? What can we do about that? Well, we can ask Enzyme to give us the import. So we're just running the command here. The, some of the, the key bindings are coming up on the right-hand side if you want to replay this yourself later. There we go. We imported Java IO file. And the red squigglies have gone away. Then we're inspecting file and the, the type hierarchy of file. You can do this on any, any, uh, any class. And we're getting method completion, including the completion of the parameters for the method. So just the kind of stuff you would expect in an IDE. But um, OK, what we did there was a command that said jump to the test for this source file. And uh, there was no test. So Enzyme created a test file for us in the right location. And of course, this is also managed by Enzyme. So we're going to get all of our semantic highlighting in here as well. And then we can run the test from there. That's just using standard SPT mode but there is an interaction with SPT. Um, it's, but it is worth pointing out there, actually, that um, when you're using Enzyme, you're much closer to the, the build tools, um, all the tools that we've been talking about here today. It's not a case of Enzyme tries to interpret the SPT build like IntelliJ or Scala IDE does. You actually use SPT directly. So all of the features and anything that you add to your build, you get the advantage of that straight away. You're a bit closer to the metal. OK, and another, and another file here. Um, what we're going to do is just show that uh, we can jump to our dependencies. So that was the jump to source feature. And we've jumped to Q, which is in the Scala standard library. Now, you're probably used to that in the IDE. But um, really, if you're using a text editor without Enzyme, that's almost impossible to do, because that's a, that's a source file that's sitting in a jar dependency. It's not a source file that's on your in your directory. So you would have to go to extra lengths. Like Dave, Dave's uh, workflow from yesterday, you would have to actually um, untar those zips somewhere. But in Enzyme, you just get it for free. You don't even need to think about it. And then we can back, back up to where we were. And we can also do the same thing for, uh, for Java files as well. So file object is something from the Apache virtual file system. And this is a, a Java file. We jumped to that from Scala. So we are getting, getting good, uh, good support. We have the browser. So that was saying bring up the Java docs for that object at, the, at point, and also bring up the Scala docs. Although uh, no one ever writes Scala docs. So it's one of the lesser used features. OK, um, this is refactoring. That's changed, actually. Um, so we, we have integration with the Scala refactoring library, which was discussed yesterday. Um, and we had a discussion yesterday after the, after the conference. And hopefully, some of those features are going to get more stable in the future as well. We've got a, a, way, a way forward of making that better. Um, and the, the way it showed there, we had a custom pop-up 
of what was going to happen in your refactoring. We've, we've, we've actually changed that. And now what happens is Enzyme will always send you a unified diff format. So it's almost like you're asking for a pull request to perform a refactoring. And then all of your refactorings can be atomic operations in your, in your, um, in your version control system, which is pretty neat. We've, uh, these are just some Emacs features of, of highlighting things. And we're showing off Scalara form here. So I completely messed up the formatting there. Um, and then just asked Enzyme and again to, to reformat it. So we've got integration with Scalara form, which is exactly the same backend that Scala IDE is using. And we can drop down to the REPL. So you don't need to use the SBT console way of doing things. You can just drop in the REPL at any point in time and just execute anything right there. And it will have exactly the same class path that your project has. Um, and we can, we can type in that. Something we'd like in the future is to get better integration with the presentation compiler from the REPL so that we get all the nice completions and so on. OK, then we're back to the, back to the beginning. We've got um, search. We've got a Lucene index of all the classes. And hopefully, we'll get better integration with Scala search, as we've seen yesterday in the future, so we can do type-based search. But at the moment, we've got everything like um, uh, camel case search and all, all that sort of stuff you would be used to in the likes of IntelliJ. OK, I think that's it. That's the end of the demo, very, very quick. Right, now I'm back to this thing. No, this is not working. Space bar. Oh, it started the presentation again. OK. Nope. On the next slide. <laughs> right. It's, oh, please work. Yes. There we go. Right. So let's just talk about the architecture for a moment, um, because it is a very different architecture to uh, to all the other IDEs, um, and this is something we certainly have changed since the last time we gave a similar presentation. Um, outside, this is the box of the Enzyme server, um, and this is a generic editor that used to say Emacs, but in the last year. The support for Atom, Sublime, and Vim has come along so well, um, we can no longer call Emacs the, the only supported editor. So you'll have your text editor here, and it'll talk to the Enzyme server over one of the two protocols that we have, which are either Swanky, which is S expressions, or Jerky, which is over JSON. Um, everything inside the dotted lines is sitting in the Enzyme server Java virtual machine um, process. And it has some other external dependencies. I mean, you've got all your source files that are on the disk, and, and your, uh, your source jars, and your Java docs, and the class files that you're compiling. And you know, the, there's a missing implicit piece here, which is your build tool. And we're, we're build tool agnostic. You don't have to use SPT. We'll, we'll support any build tool. And that's very important, because actually, every, every gig I've ever taken in Scala, actually, um, they've not used SPT whenever I've arrived. Um, I choose a Gradle or Maven or, or some in-house thing. And then there's this .enzyme file, which is something you have to generate from your build tool. And the reason we did that is um, exactly to give us a build tool, uh, make the build tool agnostic. So you generate this .enzyme file, which tells the Enzyme server where all your sources are and where all the jars are. And just anything that's specific to that project goes into here. Now, inside the server, um, well, we've got a bunch of file watchers that check for asynchronous changes to your project. Um, unfortunately, we're, we're tied to uh, Java 6. And that is because um, Java 6 is still, believe it or not, the official JDK for Scala. Um, and there are people still using Java 6. And we did a poll. So we have to support it. Um, once we go to Scala 2.12, we can move to Java 8. And that means we can rewrite these file watchers with the NIO API, which is truly async. So these can be very inefficient on large projects right now. But it's exactly the same idea as what you get with SBT's incremental compile as well, which also breaks down for large <coughs> projects. We might have an interim step where we've got some Java 7 support in here. That would be, that would be really nice. Um, OK, and everything, in, everything from here on in is implemented as an actor using ACA. Um, so the project actor is really the dispatcher. Um, when a message comes in, either an asynchronous change that we've spotted on your, on your hard drive, or something has happened that the user has requested from the editor, the project will get the message. And it will send it to one of the back end workers, um, which are all completely modular and uh, have very distinct jobs to do. 
we really like the Unix philosophy of doing, doing one thing and doing it well. So we have search, which is backed by a Lucene index and an H2 database. So that's where we know things like um, where, where uh, a fully qualified name is uh, with respect to the source file it was defined in and uh, which class file it was from. Um, so all that's in here, and that can get a lot smarter. We'll talk about that a little bit later. The source resolver, that's the thing, uh, that's the component that decides, well, given a fully qualified name that's in some uh, class file, uh, let's find the source code for that. And let's find out exactly which line in that source code it is, because uh, that, that information is not in the class files. There's a little bit of information, but not, not everything you need. Then we've got a documentation server. You've seen that in the demo. We're hosting all of the Java docs um, from the user's project on an HTTP server. And we can put other things in that HTTP server as well. Uh, so <coughs> that can be really useful. Uh, for some people, that might be the only thing that they use Enzyme for, because they don't really care for any of these fancy editor features. They just want easy access to the, the documentation of everything that they're using. And we have a debugger. So you know we have support for breakpoints and stepping. Needs a little bit of love at the moment, um, but we, we have some people who are very interested in that. Um, there, uh, there is a project called Scala Debugger. I think it's scala-debugger.org. And there is an effort to get that integrated into Enzyme. And maybe, you know, going forward, that's maybe something that we could look to share between the different editors. Could you use called Enzyme Debugger now? Could you manage to subvert it? Oh, is it? It's still on the Scala Debugger website, though. But yeah, yeah it's, it's not part of Enzyme. So it's maybe something we can share. And we have the analyzer, which is basically the presentation compiler. Um, so that talks directly to the Scala compiler and also to the Scala refactoring libraries. And um, this is really the real, this is exactly the same Scala compiler that you're using to compile your project. And we think that's really important um, because it minimizes the risk of there being uh, false positives. Um, and that actually implies something for the whole architecture of Enzyme, which is we always start up the Enzyme server using exactly the same version of Java and exactly the same version of the Scala compiler that you're using in your project. And that bypasses a whole load of problems, like syntax changes between language versions or uh, in the Java, um, on the Java side of things, uh, what gets indexed, you know, whether or not a method exists on file because it was introduced in a later version of Java. We just sidestep that entirely by always using exactly what your project is defined to use. Right, um, so that's the technical side of things. How do we organize all this? Well, because we're modular, it means we've got quite a lot of different modules that we need to kind of manage. Um, the Enzyme server is on a project called Enzyme Server under the Enzyme user on GitHub. And uh, we've got one branch, which is master at the moment. We might branch off whenever Scala 2.12 comes out, or for Dottie, for example. But that, that's currently built for Scala 2.10 and 2.11. And we're leaving a space here, because maybe, maybe 2.12 we might be able to support on the same branch. And uh, that gets, th that's all sitting there, um, and gets distributed to Sonatype every time we merge the master. So uh, we've got continuous release policy. Um, so there's, there's no version of Enzyme at the moment. It's just whatever the latest one has been cut is. And for the editors, we've got uh, the Emacs client, and we distribute that on melpa.org. Emacs users will know exactly what that means. For Atom, that's distributed through the standard Atom uh, package manager. Vim, it, that's distributed through Vundle. And for Sublime, we use packagecontrol.io, which I think is the standard Sublime one. So uh, these things are all kind of distributed in different ways, but they're always convenient for the user because it's always the standard package management system for, that, uh, for the editor. Then we've got a couple of different build tools that we support. So we've got Enzyme SBT, does all the SBT stuff. We've also got Maven and Gradle support, which have been receiving a lot more attention recently, so I'm very, very happy about that. Um, as Enzyme is now getting better Java support as well as Scala. Um, we're seeing more people coming on board wanting to get better Maven and Gradle integration, um, which is good to see. And uh, for our continuous integration, we use Docker. So we've got, you know, if you want to contribute to Enzyme, you can get your system all set up so that you've got all of the right files in the right location. But if you want to get up and running real quick, you can just pull the, uh, the Docker images um, for building whatever it is that you're 
you're wanting to contribute to. And that's got everything prepackaged, all of the SBT dependencies and everything. Um, and these are, these are what run on our CI so that we can guarantee a reproducible build. Okay, and the community. This is a this is completely new slide. It's the first time we've shown this one. Um, so I guess it used to just be Eamon, and then me and Rory and Eric came along and, and joined in. But in the last year or two, we've just seen an absolute explosion in terms of the numbers of contributors. So we've now got <laughs> 10 different uh, teams in the Enzyme organization and each one of them is, has got a different set of people who are really running those and they have you know independent merge rights admin rights in each of the repos so that's really really nice to see I mean you'll you'll see things like uh, the, the Vim people are completely independent of the the Gradle or the Emacs ones and um, everyone's just kind of getting on with things and then a lot of people then contribute back to the server um, as well because it's kind of the focal point for all of us um, uh, yeah, actually, there was a point here. There was a talk by uh, Benjamin Mako Hill at Libra Planet where he, um, he did a, an analysis of GitHub projects and showed that the vast majority of GitHub projects is just one person. Um, so we're very, very privileged that we, we have such a, an active community. It, it, it really makes it a lot of fun to, to be contributing to Enzyme. There's always people in the channel. Okay, and the principles behind it. Well, we joined type level. And uh, we, we'd actually put a code of conduct in before we joined type level, but that is a requirement of type level. And that really just f formalizes the fact that we've got a lot of good vibes going in the community. And um, you know, we, we, we want to keep that going. And if someone does come along and they have like a, a bug report or something or they want to help out, then um, we, we offer a lot of help. And typically what happens if someone raises a ticket on GitHub, um, we'll go back to them and say, hey, uh, we can help you fix this. And uh, do you want us to show you the part of the code where I would start to look? And actually, a lot of the time, that turns a bug report into a pull request from somebody, which is, which is very nice. And we try to be fast about that. And there was a talk yesterday uh, where, where this was mentioned as well, which is that you, you do want to give good reviews and give feedback, and you want to give it quickly. And you don't want to let people feel like they're, they're hanging there. You want to you really get back to them quickly and incorporate them into the community as, as soon as you can. I'm a very pragmatic approach to the way that we, we do it. I mean, everyone's a Scala developer that uses Enzyme. It's not like, uh, unless you're working on Scala ID, it's not like, uh, or, or IntelliJ, it's not like uh, your customers or traders on a desk, right? I mean, everyone that's using Enzyme should be able to interpret a stack trace whenever they get one. So we try to um, leave some of the, the errors a wee bit more raw like that so that it can just give us uh, the, the right information to, to, to fix it. So it's really keep it simple. Um, we prefer failure and explanation rather than building in complexity to work around too many corner cases. Um, a good example of this is on the Enzyme SBT side. We can be pretty harsh about demanding that your SBT build is well formed rather than um, you know, trying to work around whether you've got the right version of Scala for all your modules. If you don't have the right version of Scala for all your modules, we just blow up and say you need to fix this and point to the documentation of, uh, of how, how you can actually fix that which can annoy some people, but actually they're always very pleased in the end because it usually meant that something else was broken in their build as well. And free as in burger. <laughs> we have hackathons. Um, <laughs> and unfortunately, Libra burgers, yeah. Um, so we, we, uh, we, we typically have hackathons in London. And the rule is that if you come along and contribute to those, we get a burger. Everyone that's in it gets, gets a burger. Unfortunately, we can't offer the same thing tonight because you don't have uh, the wonderful burger joint that we have in London around the corner, but uh, <laughs> maybe that can be the, 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 the celebration after. Yeah, and also we're on, on Gitter.im when we are doing the hackathon. So uh, tomorrow we're going to be um, at the hackathon all day. So just come and join on, on the Gitter channel and you know, we'll, we'll help get you onboarded to, 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 to contributing to Enzyme if you're interested. And I mentioned earlier about continuous integration. So uh, yeah, we, we have to be really careful that we don't just release broken builds. And it has happened once or twice, um, but it, it is pretty rare. And when it does happen, we fix it real quick. So the process is that a pull request comes in, GitHub, um, and then we, we don't use Travis or Jenkins. Um, we, we use something called Drone, which is uh, free software. It, um, we host it ourselves, though, and it uses Docker. And 
that's where we can use the Docker images to run everything. I really would encourage everybody to look at Drone. It's really fantastic. It's like uh, it's much simpler than Jenkins or uh, Travis. And because you're running it on your own hardware, you're not tied to the um, to the limited machines that Travis give you. So yeah, we've got a couple of workers that are on on Drone there, and they run our formatting rules. So, if, but you know, somebody had mentioned yesterday that you automate this stuff. Um, it was Dave actually. He'd mentioned. Uh, um, you should always automate this stuff. Um, and that, that's what we do. If you don't meet our formatting rules, then we fail the build immediately. We have an extensive te unit test suite, and we've got integration tests. And we even run the Emacs tests right there. And if any of those fail, you don't, you don't get to merge your code. Um, and if that goes green, then you know, we reckon our tests are good enough that we, um, we then just release that. So that gets distributed off. We rebuild our Docker images with the latest caches, and we also distribute it to the editor and Sonatype um, repository so that those things are available right away. Another new thing, um, thanks to the community, is we've got a new website up, so enzyme.org, and we've got a new logo. So come along and help out. There's a lot of these things to do, and that's because they're still to write it. And uh, we thought, well, why wait until we've got a full website? We can get people to jump in. Question? Everything the nine got the logo? The nine. Nine gag, never heard of them. Okay, <laughs> nine gag. Okay, I'll have a look. Is this is our logo like theirs? Wonderful. <laughs> I'll have to speak. I'll have to speak to our designer about that. <laughs> yeah, and every page has an edit button on it. And what happens is, if you click that edit button, is it'll fork the repository in GitHub for you and drop you into an editor box so you can raise a pull request. Um, so hopefully the community is going to build that. And over to Rory. So you've seen Enzyme, you've seen the structure of what we're doing and how we do it. Um, I just want to reiterate really, community is amazing and I will cover that a little bit more. So what's been going on since you know Sam and I give random talks fairly regularly about what's going on in Enzyme? Um, it's all Sam's fault, we moved to the GPL. Um, because we're a packaged piece of software, we're not a library that other people use, and as we run as a server, we can do that. Um, we run a CLA assistant with inside, so if you do a pull request, it will ask you to sign the CLA before we'll merge your pull request, just to try and be consistent. Java support, has anybody used Enzyme's Java support yet? Nobody, right. <laughs> Sam has, right, excellent. So, um, Eamon's done an amazing job of actually bringing the same support we have for Scala, because often people work in mixed projects, for Java into, effectively into Emacs, so you get completions and all the rest of the good stuff. What can I say? The, crazy, the craziest thing about Enzyme recently is editors. Um, just watching Atoms, I don't actually contribute to the Atom editor, just watching the Gitter channel is nuts. They fix things faster than any of the rest of us. <coughs> More bug fixes. Um, it's a continual running process, as we'll come back to. <coughs> a lot of work recently has been to do with big projects and ensuring that when you're dealing with sort of larger projects that everything works as, as it should. So where are we going? Who's heard about uh, Enzyme 1.0? If you've been involved in any of the Gitter channels, we are always saying, yeah, we're going to release 1.0. Uh, we're nearly there. <laughs> Ish. Um, what actually happens is, we have, because we have a continuous deployment process, stuff tends to get like, oh, we'll just add this feature. And, and it, the 1.0 release just gets pushed out that little bit further. Um, but most of them are actually minor now. Beyond Thunderdome. So the idea of 1.0 and why we keep talking about it is there's a bunch of stuff we would like to be able to drop. Um, Java 6 is actually one of them because there are file watchers and various things and limitations there. <coughs> um, stuff like the Java community has moved on. Lucene uses Java 7. So beyond a certain version, you can't use Lucene beyond a certain version on Java 6 and that limits some of the stuff we want to do. Um, so really our plan is to put a mark in the sand, have a, 
a sort of feature complete functional version that people can use for legacy stuff and then sort of move forward and try and push people to, to move on. Um, and it, that's what I'm saying, it allows us bigger, bigger breaking changes. Uh, I put this in for fun. Uh, it depends when we get to 1.0. Obviously, if we if we carry on at the current rate of progress, we'll actually just be able to you know drop to 10 because it'll be 10 years old by the time we get there. Uh, said that already. Uh, I've briefly mentioned this. We do have Java support. Um, it is being developed as we go, um, and that's completely Omen's fault, and he deserves all the glory. So, where are we going next? Our 2.0 roadmap and milestone is really a catch-all for everything that we co push out from 1.0. Um, but there's some really interesting stuff coming up. So we often pull things forward. If somebody actually implements a feature that's in the 2.0 roadmap, it suddenly becomes part of 1.0. Um, big things. New debugging layer. Uh, a guy called Chip Senkbal has written a nice interface for the Java debugging API in Scala. Um, I think it's actually going to become quite a big thing outside of Enzyme, but it gives you a much higher abstraction layer over the debugging API, which if you've ever actually used it directly is uh, nasty. Now, I can never pronounce this. Graphpocalypse. This is Sam's big thing I'm going to talk about briefly, uh, which we'll come back to. Uh, 212 support, Dotty support, so, graph apocalypse. One of the limitations in Enzyme, and if you're an Enzyme user, you probably do suffer from this, is we don't support some of the features you would expect in an IDE. Uh, biggest one for me, find usages. The reason is, effectively, class files don't contain all the information you require. Effectively, it's a directed graph. So, to work out usages, you actually have to calculate the reverse graph and you've got to store it, and you've got to deal with it, and everybody has to do it. And in fact, I'm going to come back to that point a bit later. And it enables a bunch of features that, that we can't currently do and want, desperately want to do. So this is Sam's next big thing. Um, he's been a bit distracted by big project -y stuff, but this is what he's working on. That's what he keeps telling me. So we're looking at using graph databases, and as okay, it opens up all sorts of fun stuff. This is my puppy. This is the thing I care about. Um, it is in progress. I have some work on a branch. It's not yet stable. The idea is fundamentally, at the moment, Enzyme is quite hard tied to the Scala presentation compiler, as in we leak presentation compiler bits throughout our code. And I want to come up with a much cleaner interface. Why? Uh, because you should. <laughs> um, the second part is there is knowledge in Scholar IDE. There is experience there. And there's a bunch of stuff that I want to be able to share with them. They have bug fixes that we definitely don't. And I don't think we actually have any that they don't. But that's a. would like to get to that point. Um, and Dotty support. By enabling, by having a nicer interface there, we can do some, do some fun stuff. Call for the win. Oh, dear. Didn't double check my slides. Um, it should say collaboration for the win. Um, it's really fun to talk to everybody at this conference. There's some really interesting stuff. And I've been amazed by how many people are interested in working together. It really is. There's a lot of people working on this stuff, caring about this stuff, and I think there's going to be some really interesting collaborations going forward from everybody, um, Scholar ID guys, the IntelliJ guys, um, the refactoring library stuff. It's, it's an interesting place to be, and all the various tooling components. So in conclusion, um, Enzyme is a protocol-based server, I think that makes it interesting in its own way, and we can do some stuff with it. <coughs> like everybody, um, in some ways, the, the core tooling people is actually quite a small group of people. And I'm hoping that we this, this conference actually persuades people to come and join in. 
For us, community has been insane. Um, what happens in Enzyme now is there's a bunch of people working on stuff that I'm not even aware it's going on. In, in the early days, there was two or three of us. Everybody knew what was going on. Everybody knew what was people working on. Now, people are implementing features in editors that I've never even tried, let alone know what they're doing. Uh, and we are making progress. Things are, things are definitely moving forward. Uh, and one of the things that really interests me is a talk that's coming straight after this is about how tooling integration can, uh, can come together. So uh, one quick thing before we move on to questions. Uh, this afternoon there is a, an enzyme hacking session. I believe there's an enzyme hacking session, an IntelliJ hacking session, and a Scala ID hacking session all at the end of the day. Um, if you want to come along to the enzyme one, please do. Um, what I would suggest before you did that is check out the code and run Gen Enzyme, because otherwise we're going to kill the network when everybody in the room does it all at once. So there we go. Uh, questions? Do you want to come back up, Sam? Sorry, the yeah, it's it's single user. Um, it's running for your project in your on your on your machine. Um, you could. Um, it's actually quite an interesting thing. It's actually something I do in Scalinator, oddly. Um, which is all of the a lot of the user completions and so on are actually running under one server in a cloud environment. Uh, the problem there is you've got you've got uh, text synchronization issues. You've got to deal with different people in different editors, and what it actually means when somebody tries to do a complete when you've got three people editing stuff. But yeah, that's. You have shown an example of uh, code generation, uh, of the generation of a test. Is there any support for templates or, say, sublime snippets? Yeah, that's all on the editor side. So actually, that was just in uh, using Yas snippet in Emacs. Um, yeah, that's not something the server would really support. That's the kind of thing that um, the, the editor should, should really be doing. But having said that, Yas is a cross-editor <coughs> platform, so we can share the, the templates across the editors. Uh, did you see any false negative uh, syntax highlighting in uh, editor? <laughs> uh, yes. Um, so this is a this is a no, and it's really quite interesting talking to the tooling guys because if you if you deal with um, Scala IDE and <coughs> Enzyme suffer from if you see it in Scala IDE, you'll see it in Enzyme. Um, the presentation compiler has some, let's say hacks in some performance optimization so it works for interactive modes that sometimes means it gives up too early and stuff that will compile will show as a false positive uh, inside a, a presentation session. Um, it's interesting that uh, IntelliJ has the same problem but often on different different bits. But not not, not uh, false positive, positive but false negative when the error is not present. Um, Generally, generally not, because fundamentally we're running the, the presentation compiler, because we're running the real Scala compiler, I think is. Some checks are not performed by the presentation compiler, like overriding checks. So if you forget an override keyword, you will not get the error until you build. But that's by design, let's say. Yeah, actually, one, one of the things we want to do is, is go more in that direction. I'd rather get um, false negatives than false positives, because false positives are extremely annoying, and false, uh, false negatives you can always catch by the real compiler. And in our editors, we've got good support between running the actual build and then going back to the code that failed. So there are some initiatives we want to do to go further than what Scala IDE is currently doing and detect common patterns of failure and um, just suppress them. Um, even do that for um, performance optimization. I mean, for example, if you're using Shapeless, they've got something called a cached implicit, which is a nice way of you being able, and you don't even have to be using it for Shapeless code, but if you've got some complicated um, implicit that you're using in your code, you could use cached implicit, and we're going to hopefully override that and then basically turn it into a null operation. So if, you, if you've not set up your implicit resolution properly, um, yeah, you'll get a false negative there. But the thing is, you won't take like maybe a 
30 seconds to wait for that to compile every time you type in a character, it'll be instant, so you'll get a very, very snappy response. Um, one controversial thing I would say there is that we're getting a lot of users coming to us from IntelliJ recently um, because they're saying that the enzyme um, presentation compiler, the, the red squigglies, are actually better on their project than the IntelliJ one. So um, I think the presentation compiler and a, a lot of the work in the back end there has really come along very, very well, especially in 2.11. So you mentioned uh, separate modules for different components, um, and you mentioned GPL. Um, if we're going to reuse some of those components, um, isn't GPL a problem? Um, yeah, so the thing is, and all the bits that we would be sharing, we're okay using Apache for that. Just um, the thing is, we, we, we own the copyright, um, so we can, we can do that. And we can even go back to the version when it was Apache. Um, I, actually, not everything's using GPL. It's just the enzyme server and the Emacs bit. So yeah, I, th I think we've got one last question there. But just to say that the different packages, uh, for example, the editor components are often done in the license for whatever editor they're done, and we, we're fairly we try and be, as, as Sam said in the talk, we try and be pragmatic about this stuff. So one very last quick one. Is that uh, how's uh, the template library pronounced? I don't know. The Yas library? Yeah, Yas snippet, I think it is. OK, how do I spell it? Y Y-A-S. Y-A-S, OK. Cool. OK, I think that was the last question. So thank you, Sam. Thank you, Rory, for the presentation.